Hi, this is Kevin. Welcome to my Beyond the Textbook lecture that's associated with Chapter 11 of the Zell 3rd Edition Python textbook. And in addition to the copies of these slides, in your weekly schedule, you should be finding uh, a download for a project demonstrations to supplement Zell 3E Chapter 11. And that's where a lot of the code that I'm going to be uh, talking about and showing you uh, can be found. Okay. So uh, Chapter 11 is about data collections. And uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the content in chapter 11 is about the Python list. And uh, we really can't emphasize enough how versatile the list is. Um, lists have a reliable order that comes in handy. That order can be changed. So you can change it by sorting the list, by reversing the list, and by manually rearranging the list. So uh, you could do that by um, it deleting items from the list in one place and inserting them in other places. Um, so there's a lot you can do with order. Okay. Uh, as I just said, items uh, can be added and removed. Items can be replaced with other items. And items uh, uh, can be all of the same type or of uh, different uh, types. Um, if you want to say that in a, fanciest, uh, a fancier way, you can say they can have a homogeneous uh, type or they can have heterogeneous uh, types. So um, all this uh, work, or most of it, is done by calling the methods of the list class. And uh, here's a, a partial list of some of them, append, insert, pop, remove, uh, clear. OK. And if you want a fuller list, uh, this uh, title of the slide is a link to the page in the documentation that has a lot of information about um, uh, calling the methods on list. OK, and then some more um, methods of the list class include um, index, uh, count, uh, sort, which we're going to talk about quite a bit, reverse, and uh, copy, which would allow you to make a shallow copy of the list. Um, a shallow copy in that um, when we have lists of uh, complex objects that have sub-objects, um, you won't get uh, copies of the sub-objects. That's what they mean by shallow as compared to uh, deep. Um, well, and uh, we have the link up here to the documentation again. All right. OK, so let's talk a bit about how to change list order. It was covered in the textbook, so I don't want to beat it to death. But um, one reliable way to this to do this is to call the sort method of the list object that you're working with. And that's what they talked about in the textbook. Um, another thing that you can do um, is you can create a new list using the sorted function. So it's a whole separate function. It's not a method of the list class. Uh, it takes the same parameters and it behaves in a similar way, but it throws off a new list. OK. Um, the other thing you might want to do with the list is to put it into just the reverse order that it's currently in. And in order to do that uh, in place, um, the, the list 
uh, has the reverse method, which uh, it changes the order of the list to uh, the reverse order. Now, there is a parallel function called reversed. It doesn't precisely give you a new list. It gives you something pretty close to it. It gives you an iterator over the original list that presents the item in reverse order. So if you want a new list, you have to call list on reversed on the original list. And I'll show you that in a minute. So uh, it, here are the considerations. Why would you want to do something in place rather than throwing off a new list? Well, uh, reordering the list in place affords the overhead of creating a new list. Okay, and if you have a really big list, uh, this could be a lot of computing. Okay. Creating a new reordered list preserves the state of the original object. And uh, that's often important. So these are trade-offs and you have to uh, figure out what's really important to you in the use case that you have at hand. Okay, so uh, let's explore some of this a bit. Um, this is a good chance to use the REPL. Okay, so let's go to the Python console here and work with the REPL. So um, let's, uh, let's create a list called numbers. Okay, so we're going to assign it all uh, the values uh, 6, 33, minus 499, not an M, 0, 11. Okay. So we didn't want an M there either. Okay. So these are all ints. So I'm going to press enter and it's going to say it found it. So if we type in numbers, we should see what the value is. And we see we have a list with those uh, values. And you can see that they're in order. Okay. So um, let's sort those. So, so we could say numbers and call sort. Okay. And then let's type in numbers again to see what it is. And they're sorted into order. Okay, but we've actually changed uh, the order. Okay. Um, uh, what if we didn't want to change? Um, oh, what if we wanted to sort it in the opposite order? Well, that wouldn't be too hard. We could, we could say uh, numbers. Uh, call the sort method and then use the keyword parameter uh, reverse equal true. And then we ask for numbers again and we can see we've really changed the order. Okay, but what if we didn't want to change the order? So now we have this in this a uh, descending order. So let's try let's uh, try some, some strings. So let's have a, let's create a list of names. Okay. And um, the names are going to be uh, Jose. Um, Ye Kevin Divya and um, Mary. 
Okay. So this is the original order. Okay. So now uh, if we type names, we'll see that it's still in the original order. Okay. So uh, um, what if we wanted to, oh, let's go playing with uh, reverse. Okay, so let's say uh, names reverse. Okay, so that's going to change the actual object. Names, yep. So it's in the exact opposite order than we had it before. Okay. Um, now, what if we say uh, this? What if we say uh, new names guess assigned uh, names as it as it uh, I'm sorry call reversed names okay so uh, new names um, oh it's a reversed iterator o over that so it doesn't give us it doesn't create a new list okay well how could we turn that into a new list uh, well, we could say that we want a list of new names. Okay, and that, that has it back in the original order. So if we want to use reversed and truly get a new list, we'd have to do this. We'd have to say a list of reversed uh, names. And that's going to throw off a whole new list. Okay. So, um, uh, again, uh, uh, sorted and reversed are ways that we can get new, new orders um, without uh, disturbing the original order. And uh, sort and reverse are ways to actually change the order um, of the list that we're working on. Okay, and you just have to decide what you want to do. You you probably want to change it in place if you don't have another use for that object in its original order, and especially if it's a really long list. Um, and you don't want to recreate it just just because. Okay. All right. So much for changing the order of a list. Um, sorting uh, details. And we talked about these in the chapter, I think, itself. So um, we specify the key for the sort using the key equals keyword parameter. Um, and we give it the name of a function that provides a, uh, a key, okay? And uh, if we want to change the order from ascending to descending, we use the reverse equals true uh, keyword parameter. Okay, now um, one thing that we cover in our course that's kind of touched on in the Zell text, um, and I talked about when I did the lecture, is uh, the issue of using a custom data holder class for sorting. The only problem is that the class that he uses in the text is one that's hanging around from chapter 10. And it's really not a good example of a Python uh, data holder class. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show that to you here again with um, kind of more up-to-date uh, code. OK? Uh, so first of all, what's our motivation for doing this, right? Well, what would be the alternative to holding um, a group of uh, data facts if we didn't have a custom Python class? Well, one thing is we could just uh, put them into a list. Or if they weren't going to change, we could put them into a tuple 
Uh, okay. Uh, and both of those, I, I think, are fine for holding like a row of data that we read from a file or uh, a row from a relational database uh, table. But the, the drawback in using lists and tuples to hold these uh, data rows is that we can only refer to the fields using index numbers. So the first field would be index 0, and then 1, and then 2, and then 3. Um, and that's not good uh, documentation. It leads to uh, coding errors, and it's pretty low readability. So if we use a custom Python class, then we can refer to each of the fields using their field name. And we feel that this reduces the number of coding errors that we get and improves the readability of the code. So that's the motivation for using these custom data holder classes. OK, so um, um, first, before I show you the program that does the sorting, let's uh, close this and let's look at um, Here's an example data holder class that I use quite often. Uh, it's in a file called My States. Okay. And um, the class itself is pretty small. Okay. It's just uh, two, four, six, eight lines long. Okay. And it, uh, it begins uh, with this uh, decorator called data class um, that says it's uh, it uses the data class feature of Python that was implemented in Python 3.7. And then we give, uh, we have the header for the class, it's called state. And then we list each of the fields, a colon and their type. So this uh, class has three fields, state name, which is a string, land area and square miles, which is a float, water area and square miles, which is a float. And it has one method, OK? Uh, and that's called calculate total area and square miles, OK? And it returns the sum of the land area and square miles plus the water area and square miles. And um, We'll often refer to this uh, kind of a method as, as a convenience method because, you know, the user could add together the land area and the water area in their code, in their kind of calling client code. But uh, usually the polite thing to do is to provide a method for uh, that will that will calculate any of the values we'd want uh, to use associated with a state class. And that assures that the client code is all calculating it the same way. OK. Now, the rest of the things that we have here, uh, we have to have an import for uh, 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 data class. Uh, we're using a uh, module that I, I put together called unit test helpers that I'm going to show you how to use soon, but not quite yet. And in the main, we put some unit test code. And again, I'm going to show you how to do that, but not quite yet. OK, so that's the class. So the fields are state name, land area and square miles, water area and square miles, and then uh, we have a method that we can call calculate total area in square miles, which is going to return the sum of the land area and the water area. OK, so that's the data holder class. It's really, again, it's really very simple. It's only eight lines long. OK. And uh, now we're going to introduce uh, the program that uses the data holder class. Uh, and it's called uh, 05 using custom data holder class for sorting. OK, so this is how we would use uh, something like this. Uh, first of all, 
we're going to need to create instances of the data holder class. Um, and the way that we do that is, uh, is we call this a uh, special method that we call the constructor, the constructor which creates new state objects. Uh, we didn't have to code that ourselves because um, the data class feature creates it for us automatically. So, um, and we pass it the field values in order. So the state name was a string. And then the land area in square miles was a float, and the water area in square miles was a float. And it passes back a reference to that state object, which we're keeping in S1. And if we want to print it, we can print it either by calling string on the variable name, or if we just say we want to print the variable name, implicitly it calls string. So I'm going to take all of our code here that we have so far. OK, and I'm just going to put the rest of the code into uh, a comment, except for the call to me. OK, so we created Wisconsin in a variable S1, and we're going to print it explicitly calling for the string of S1, and then just saying to print S1, which implicitly calls for the string. OK. And what do we get? Uh, creating Wisconsin object. Uh, here we can see uh, the name of the class and the value of each of the three fields inside of it. And uh, we get the same rendition of this if we explicitly use a call to string or when we print there's always an implicit call to string and we get the same uh, thing. So that's how we created Wisconsin. That was pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, now um, here's what we want to do. Let's prove that we can get back the value of the three fields um, that we stored. OK, so to refer to the state name field, we just use variable name dot um, field name. So S1 dot state name, S1 dot land area in square miles, S1 dot water area in square miles. So let's um, let's run that. And you can see we got the state name, the land area in square miles, uh, the water area in square miles. And I'm I'm certain that the values I'm using here are all made up because I made them up. OK, well, that all works pretty much as expected. And now we're going to show off what happens when you have a method to call that's going to bring back a value for you. Well, in order to call calculate total area in square miles, we use the variable name dot calculate total area in square miles. And because it's a method, you need the parentheses on the end. OK, so we don't use it exactly the same way that we use the name of a field. Because it's a method, we need to have the parentheses to hold any parameters. OK, this doesn't take any parameters. so. Uh, the prem, uh, the parentheses are empty. Okay, uh, and here is here is the uh, total, and it looks like we've got uh, one hundred and fifty thousand plus ten thousand is giving us one hundred and sixty thousand. Okay, so that seems to have worked fine. All right, so. Uh, Let's put these things in a list and sort it, OK? So uh, uh, here we print that that's what we're going to do. So where do you have the Wisconsin state objects? So we need to create two more. So in S2, we create, uh, we, you know, we create a 
an instance of the state a class for Illinois, and we we save the reference in S2. In S3, we save the reference to a Florida object. And then we create a list called states that has S1, S2, and S3. It's a list of three of these state objects. Okay. And then we say we're going to print them in the original order. Okay. And then we just do the typical, uh, typical for state and states print state. So let's get a look at that. And what comes out at the bottom? Uh, printing states in original order. And we get them Wisconsin, Illinois, Florida. That's the order that we put them in. Okay, so let's do some sorting. Okay. So how are we going to sort? Well, we mentioned uh, before that uh, we call the sort method on, on the list object. And then we pass in a keyword parameter. It's the name of the function that returns the sort key. OK, and then we look down here. Uh, let me uncomment that. That one's called uh, by name. OK. So what does this do? Well, this uh, takes a state instance and it returns the state name field value. OK. And how does this get used? This gets used by sort. OK. When sort wants to know what the what the key field is for a particular instance, um, it calls the method that we pass it. And that it passes back the key. And this this whole approach is called inversion of uh, control, sometime, sometimes referred to as the Hollywood uh, 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 principle. Don't call us, we'll call you. OK, so the sword is in control. And whenever it wants a key for a state object, it calls the function that we gave it, which returns the appropriate uh, key. Which is why, um, why when we pass this by name, okay, we're not putting parens at the end of this. This is a problem with uh, PyCharm. In PyCharm, if you do this, if you start to type in by name, because oh, by name, if you take auto completion here, I press enter, it'll put in the parentheses. Well, that's not the name of the function. That's a call to the function. We're trying to pass the function. So uh, it's sort that can call that function when it's good and ready to. OK, so this says it's going to sort them by name. Uh, let's see if it does. OK, so it sorted them Florida, Illinois, Wisconsin. Those are in name order. OK, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to sort these by, what's the next one? Well, we have another function here uh, that's by land area. So the sort passes at a state instance, a state object, and it extracts the land area in square miles. And it passes back and says, oh, this is the sort key for this object. Okay, so let's go back up. So we're going to, this time we're going to sort by land area, and then we're going to print them. So let's give this a run. Uh, and here we are. Now, again, these are phony numbers, so you can't go by your knowledge of US uh, geography. So it looks like we had Illinois in at 100,000. Florida, we said it was 125,000, and Wisconsin was 150,000. Um, so that's land area and square miles in ascending order. OK, and then the very last thing that we're going to do is we're going to sort on a value that you get by calling a function. Uh, I'm sorry, by calling a method. And that's uh, by total area. So let's. Let's find that um, 
Okay, yeah. So we're going to we're going to do it by total area. Okay, and if we go down to by total area down here, um, uh, this is going to have to call the method calculate total area in square miles to get the value for the sort key. Okay. And again, if we run this, uh, it turns out that they're in the same order, Illinois, Florida, Wisconsin. We don't see the total area because it's not one of the fields for the class. Okay. But if we went through and we added these, we would realize that these are in the appropriate area by, in the appropriate order by uh, the total area. Okay, so that's how we sort. And that's why these uh, custom uh, Python data holder classes are ideal uh, for records that we have to sort uh, because they lead to code that's uh well less likely to make errors when you're getting index numbers wrong that's what you'd have to do uh you'd have to use the index references if you use a list or a tuple so here you get to use the names it's better documentation it's easier to read and it's less error prone. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, Python uh, dictionaries were talked about in the chapter, and uh, we had pretty good uh, coverage for them. Uh, we were able to show how to do a lookup, and that's how they're typically used. Okay, um, so I'm not covering them further here, but uh, a related uh, Python type I am going to cover here, and that's the Python set. That's not in the Zell book. That's not in a typical beginner uh, Python book. Okay. Uh, but we're going to cover it here uh, with regard to just two, two use cases that it has that I think are important even for beginners. Okay, so uh, if we're going to use a list, a Python list holds a collection of values. Okay, the Python dictionary holds a collection of key value pairs. And again, we went through that in, in the regular chapter. Now, a Python set holds a collection of keys. Okay, they're like values, but they're keys. We can use them to directly access um, the item that we're looking for. Uh, like the dictionary, this set does not have a reliable order. So it has fast random access, but it doesn't have a reliable order like a... Um, like a list. So there are some features of sets that are very powerful that we're not going to cover here. Uh, they have to do with reasoning about set membership. Um, and it, they're very powerful things that you can do where you can look at the union of sets and the intersection of sets, all kinds of things that have to do with set theory. Uh, that's not the stuff I think you need to know about sets as a beginner. In this course, we're going to cover two key features of sets. Feature one, searching for keys in sets is substantially faster for searching for values in lists. Okay, so if you have anything but just a very small list of values you want to search, um, you do better to to uh, turn it into a set. And also, sets do not allow duplicate keys. And there are times when we want a collection, but we don't want duplicates in it. And so the set is a natural choice for that. Uh, so searching for a key in a set. So like uh, Python uh, uh, dictionaries, 
Python sets are implemented with these things called hash uh, tables, which gives uh, direct access to uh, uh, the items based upon their key. So searching for a key in a set has performance similar to searching for a key in a dictionary. It's very fast and it doesn't slow down appreciably when um, the number of items that you're searching in gets large. Okay, so for any appreciable number of items, searching in a set is substantially faster than searching a list. Okay, so um, we we have a lookup that we've been doing um, in our class where we're looking up the name of a sales region based upon the region number, and we've got four different values. OK, well, we've done that a lot of different ways. OK, um, and they're all pretty fast. OK, but when we're looking up something that has a lot of possible values, like hundreds or thousands, um, the set is going to be the way to go. OK. Um, so. Um, I've got a program that I want to show you. I, I don't list it here, but this is one that I'm going to want to show you. Uh, it's called uh, 30 searching for um, a key in a set. OK, now I'm introducing a couple of new ideas here. It's not just uh, searching in a set. OK, so uh, here's what I'm doing. I said to myself, what what could we be searching for that we could have a list of valid values? And I was thinking of, well, if we worked at a company that had products, maybe product code. So I said, well, what about normal people who don't have products? Well, maybe they would be interested in validating a zip code that they were going to enter. OK, so I went out and I looked on the web and I found uh, an organization that publishes um, lists of zip codes. OK, and they had a free version. So this uh, this uh, this uh, company, I think it's called US Zips. OK, and I, I downloaded their files, which is a CSV file. Let's take a look at this this uh, comma separated values uh, file. And this may be the first time we've seen one of these. Uh, each of the values is, uh, is separated from the subsequent one with a comma. And normally, um, so line one is uh, typically just a list of the column labels. And then starting on line two, you have the data. And um, it's possible to surround each of the values with uh, quote marks, OK? But normally, we only, um, we only surround things with quote marks if they have internal spaces or if they have internal commas, like um, oh, this is the name of uh, a city in Puerto Rico. And you can see that um, if you had both the city name and and uh, Puerto Rico, you might have a comma inside. But this one has uh, quote marks around everything, which is uh, kind of uh, tedious. But the, the first field that we're looking for uh, is uh, the zip code. OK, and how many of these are there? I think there's like 34,000. Let's look. Uh, 33,789, but one of the first row was had the header, so 33,788 zip codes. And their documentation says that this isn't a complete list, and, and their license for us to use it is right here. I've included that too. 
and it's it's certainly free for educational use and i think free for commercial use if you give them proper attribution but if you really want the one that's up to date and the one that has uh, literally all the zip codes they have a paid version okay so i created a program that creates a set from that list okay uh, and here's here's what I did. I hid all the details in a function called get valid zip code set. And that's a function that we're going to see in a minute that returns a set that just uh, uh, is the zip code keys. Okay. And then I wrote a program. And here's what I, I did. I, I, uh, uh, I wrote a kind of a fairly usable thing that works at the console with the user. We begin with a priming read. We get the user input in which we say, please enter a valid five digit zip codes and just plain enter for stop. Okay. And then we have the while loop. So while we haven't gotten just plain enter, uh, if the response is in, valid zip codes, this is how you check for a key in a set, uh, well then we print uh, response is a valid zip code, else response is not a valid zip code. And then at the bottom of the loop, we prompt the user again. Okay, so let's uh, play the game here, see how that goes. Okay, so uh, uh, here's some towns I know, uh, Glenview, Illinois, 60025, yeah, uh, Haddonfield, New Jersey, 08033, okay, uh, North Palm Beach, Florida, 33408, yep, they're all valid. And you can run this and, and put in the zip codes of where you've lived and it's probably, um, it's probably going to find it. And then if I put in 99999, not a valid zip code. Okay. If I put in hi mom, not a valid uh, zip code. And we don't have anything to compare this to, and uh, there certainly is, uh, in the, you know, there is a function in uh, Python called timeit. There's a a package called uh, timeit, T-I-M-E-I-T, uh, that allows you to measure the performance of uh, various versions of code, and it would be fun to go. Uh, compare the version of this that uses a set to the version of this that uses a list. Um, uh, 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 trust me, the performance of the list is going to be uh, lightning fast. I, I mean, the set is going to be lightning fast uh, compared to the list. Oh, okay, so how did I create that set? Well, let's go take a look at that. Um, I did it in uh, get valid zip code set, okay. And uh, what did I do? Well, I did the normal stuff I do when I'm going to open a file. Uh, I had put it in the data directory. It's called uszips.csv, and then I made a zip code file path and file name, and then I opened it. And then it turns out that there's this uh, package called uh, CSV for comma separated values. And uh, it's pretty handy. One of these days I'm going to include it in the course more formally. But um, it it's very helpful in um, doing uh, two things. One, skipping that first row that has all the headers. Okay, because that's not data that we want. Okay, and then there are ways to read these. If they don't have a lot of quote marks in them, you can read these as just regular files and skip the first row. Okay, but uh, when you have a lot of things to put into quotes, um, it works well to use this uh, reader class from the 
CSV uh, package. And so what you do is, is you just open the file and then you pass it to the reader. You create a new reader with the file. And this is another kind of iterator. So you're able to iterate over the reader. And the reader has magic. Um, one thing you're able to do is you can skip a row by just calling the next uh, function on the reader. So that skipped a row. OK. Uh, and then I'll get back to line 36 in a minute. Line number 37, for row in zip code, reader you're able to read these a row at a time and you're just able to unpack them now i've used an unpacking a trick here that i don't think i've really documented in the course uh, so far if we are going to have extra things when we unpack we can we can have a last entry in the list of things to unpack and we put an asterisk in front of some variable name you can call it whatever you want i called it rest and this use of the asterisk is called splat s-p-l-a-t and what this means is put any of the things that are being unpacked that don't fit into the explicit list i gave you cram them all into the variable rest so this way I only wanted to get the first one, so I could have asked for the first one, I guess. But instead, I wanted to be able to show you that you can actually unpack things that have many more values than you want. And you can just uh, find uh, a place for the unused ones uh, to go using the splat operator. Okay, so then, then uh, I had unpacked the zip code. And uh, I did add on the zip code. So the way that we, we, we add a key to a set is by calling the method add. OK. Now, so what we did is we began with an empty set, right? Now, one thing that it's, that's kind of tricky is um, you'll know that if we want to create an empty list, we use the the square brackets without anything in them and that means empty list if we want to create an extra dictionary we use the curly braces without anything in them and that means an extra dictionary well because sets also use curly braces if you have an initializer with a bunch of uh, values uh, using the curly braces doesn't mean empty set it means empty dictionary so how does one get an empty set? Well, one just calls set and doesn't pass anything to it. So we called set without passing anything uh, to it. And that gave us an empty set for zip codes. And then as we read through these, we added each of the zip codes. Um, and then we closed the file. And then we returned zip codes and that was the set with uh, approximately 34,000 zip codes we got back up here with valid zip codes and if we run it again uh um one two three four five is there a one two three four five i hope not yeah and um, uh, 60026 is another part of my town, Glenview. So that's the valid zip code. All right. And then when we say enter, we stop. Thanks for playing. Oh, OK. So you should know that if you have a big list of things where you want to look up a key to see if it's in there, you're going to want to use a set rather than a list because the performance is lightning fast. And when the lists get big, the performance of searching them gets pokey, really pretty slow. OK. So that was searching for a key in a set. OK, so for any appreciable number of items, searching a set is substantially faster than searching a list. Um, 
So another use case is important for uh, beginners is uh, it turns out that sets, because the way that set theory works, they just don't it can, can contain uh, uh, duplicates. Okay, a member is is either a member of the set or it's not. It can't be a member of the set twice, right? So that there are no duplicates in sets, and um, that is pretty useful. So among other things, when we're creating a set, if we call add on a duplicate value, it doesn't blow up. It just it, it ignores it. So, um, you know, my zip code here is uh, 60025, where I'm sitting as I record this in Glenview, Illinois. And I could call that once when I created the zip code set or two or three or four times and it would just get added to the set one time the other ones would just be ignored okay and sometimes that's pretty helpful for uh, the use case you have at hand another thing that we have to do sometimes and we actually have a uh, uh, a problem on the homework uh, where we need to remove the duplicates from a list Okay, well, here's what you can do. You can t take the list, convert it to a set, and then convert that back to a list again. Now, when you convert it to a set, it just ignores all the duplicates. And when you convert it back to a list, well, then you have a list without the duplicates. Okay, you should know that because sets don't have a reliable order, well, then it's not going to preserve the order of the original list. So let's just look at this uh, behavior for a minute. Let's go, let's find the Python console again. Okay. And let's create something called my set. Okay. And let's initialize it. If you want to have a, uh, and explicit initializers, you do use the curlies. Okay, so, and we might say uh, one, three, five, seven, and nine. Okay, so that's what we have. Okay, and if we type my set, it should show us what's in there. And it has the set of one, three, five, seven, nine. So if you have the curly braces and you're not showing key value pairs, well, then they're just keys. It's a set. Okay. All right. So what if we said uh, my set add, uh, sorry. 11. Okay, it did that and then type my set. There's 11. It added it. What if we say my set add 9? Well, that's a duplicate. Is it going to blow up? No. <laughs> it just it just says fine. I already had 9. I don't care. All right. Um Oh, 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 all right, so yeah, uh, so you can't add a duplicate. It's just not possible, okay? And sometimes that's just the use case that you had. Now, what if you have a what if you have a list that has uh, duplicates? Okay, so let's um, uh, let's create a list called silly, okay? And it has uh, one. Two, one, three, two, four, five, six, six, seven, one, eight, nine, nine, ten. Okay. So that's our list. We definitely have duplicates in there. So we say silly, and we have all those. Now, 
here's what we can do. We can say, uh, let's create something called not silly. Okay. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to take, uh, we're going to take uh, silly. Okay. And we're going to call set on it to convert it to a set. Okay. And then we're going to call a list on that to convert that set back to a list. Okay. And let's see what's in not silly. Okay, so it did it did preserve the order, but I'm not sure that you can rely on that. Okay, so we got rid of all the duplicates, but by definition, um, that set that's in the middle of that doesn't have a reliable order. So it gave us a reliable order, but we don't we can't always uh, count on that. But that's a really quick way to vacuum the duplicates out of a list, especially if it's a short list. Okay, so that's that. Okay, so we're going to cover a couple of things in this extra Python features uh, department. Okay, um, you remember that we call them syntactic sugar because these are these are uh, these are features that we don't really have to have. They're conveniences to make it easier to code something or eh, more likable to code something. But they're features that we already have. We can already do these things with the features that we've learned in the basic uh, course. Okay, so now we're going to learn two more. Okay, and the first one is the Lambda. Okay, and people talk about Lambdas all the time with uh, Python. So if you're a new Python person and you hear people throwing about Lambda, um, it, can, it can sound kind of uh, uh, daunting. Okay, but Lambdas are actually pretty simple. Okay, a, 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 a Lambda is a shorthand function. Okay, so it's a very, very easy way to code a function. Uh, you don't give it a name, so it's an anonymous function. Okay, and you're able to use it wherever you would use a function. So you just code it in line. Okay, so um, in fact, yeah, so. Um, if we really want to see a lot about lambdas, there's a good article here, and this is on real Python here. And let me bring this over. So, uh, how to use Python lambda functions, and it this is uh, great. Okay, uh, so I recommend it highly. Okay, so uh, so lambdas are short anonymous functions that we create with this shorthand syntax. Now, before you even worry about them one time, I want to emphasize any lambda can be recoded as a regular function. And the name that function and the name of that function can be used in place of the lambda. So we use the lambda where we would have coded a function name. Okay? Um, and so Anytime somebody says you need a Lambda and you go, oh, God, I can't remember how to code a Lambda. Well, just go down in the code somewhere, code a function, right? And then use that function name where you would use the Lambda. So here's the syntax. We begin with the word Lambda, okay? And then we have a parameter name. Usually there's only one. But you can have a two or three or four. So there's a parameter list that ends with a colon. Okay. And then we have an expression. Okay. Now the expression usually uses the parameter or else why uh, pass it. Okay. 
So uh, here's the thing that we could do. Uh, we could uh, we could specify a sort a sort key for a student. So we could say lambda student. Okay, so it's students the name of the parameter. Okay, and then we say student calculate GPA. Okay, so what does this expression mean? This is what the function's going to return. Okay, so this is an alternative to writing a function that just says return student dot calculate GPA. That's all it does. Okay. Um, or uh, maybe we're going to do something like this. Um, we want to take a variable state. Okay. And it's going to have, uh, you know, the two character state code, you know, IL for Illinois, WI for Wisconsin, etc. And so if this says that it's going to use the string in state if state equal equal IL, else out of state. So this is a simple ternary if that's going to it's going to return in state or out of state. This is either an in state student or an out of state student. Okay, based upon state, which we're going to uh, pass in. Okay, or we can say uh, uh, salary. Say so we're going to return salary less than or equal to fifty thousand. So that's going to return true um, if the salary is less than or equal to fifty thousand and false if otherwise. So all three of these are functions that are expecting to be passed a parameter. And they all work on that inversion of control principle, that Hollywood uh, principle, don't call us, we'll call you, that we use for sort keys. And so we would use a lambda any place that we, we would be providing a function Okay, uh, that could be called by other code in one of these inversion of control schemes. Okay, and if we want to learn more, we can go how to use lambda functions. Okay, so uh, some lambda use uh, cases. So again, a lambda is just short, shorter syntax for, for providing functions to tools that use the inversion of control pattern. The Hollywood principle, don't call us, we'll call you. Um, you can use it for specifying sort keys. Um, we could use it with uh, the sort method of the list uh, class or the sorted function. Okay. We can also use it as shorter syntax for providing functions uh, to tools that either filter or transform when using uh, data science uh, tools. So one of the reasons that I cover this in the class, even though it's not in the beginner's uh, textbooks, is that if you're learning pandas, uh, it, it, the, the pandas uh, data structure has a method called apply. Okay, and it takes a short function. Okay, so people use lambdas there. Okay, could you code a separate function with a name and pass that name? Yeah, you could. But people typically use lambdas. And if you're using the data science tool PySpark, uh, the PySpark uh, uh, data structure class has a method called filter and it's expecting you to pass a function uh, that says um, are we going to include this yes or no true or false okay and it's expecting to get a, a function people usually pass it a lambda so we're we're just learning about lambdas now so when you get to data science courses and they're teaching you 
uh, to code these things as a lambda, we're going to remember, oh, lambdas are just shortcut syntax for very short anonymous functions. So we're going to take a look at this um, expressing sort keys using lambdas. And I think this says uh, uh, 05, but it's really 50. So I apologize for that. First uh, timeout with the slides. So, yep. No, it's 40. <laughs> There's no sense to it at all. So it's 40 expressing sort keys using lambdas. Apologize for that. Okay, so what, here's what I did. I just went back to that um, uh, program that we we had, uh, which was 05 using a custom uh, data holder class for sorting. And I just said, what if I didn't want to express the sort keys with a function? What if I did it with a lambda? So um, if we just go back and look at 05, right? You'll remember that we put the functions for the sort keys, we just put them down at the end of the program. Okay, and then when we went to pass the sort key, we just said key equal function name. Okay, so if we go to this 40, all right, we have no functions down at the bottom because we're going to use lambdas. Okay, so my three sorts, instead of say key equals function name, I just say lambda, okay, then there's a parameter name, the state, okay? And uh, what's it going to return? It's going to return the state dot state name. Uh, or with the with this one that does the land area in square miles, okay? So the parameter is the state. What's it going to return? The state dot land area in square miles. Or the last one, uh, what if we want the total area in square miles? Well, again, the parameter name is going to be the state, and it's going to return the state, calculate total area in square miles, paren, paren, because it's a function. Now, a lot of times uh, when you see lambdas uh, used in... Um, Oh, examples that you'll see. Let's go back and look at the example that I pointed you to, the one in uh, real Python, okay? And one thing that's often hard to do is that the examples often use, uh, they often use very short parameter names like X or Y or Z, okay? And it, it leaves you thinking, well, what is X? What, where does X come from? And the thing to remember is that uh, these are functions that are going to be called, okay? In this case, it's going to be called by sort. Okay, sort's going to pass in a parameter. We don't want to call it X or Y or Z. We want to call it some meaningful name like the state. Okay, and then we use that parameter name in the expression that creates the value with that it's going to return. Okay, it's that easy. Oh, brought over the wrong thing. So the first of these uh, kind of extra language features, uh, syntactic sugar was lambda. Um, the next one is uh, a Python list comprehension. Now, Python list uh, comprehensive comprehensions um, are shorthand tools for creating a list, okay? 
the word comprehension was incomprehensible to me. I, I couldn't get what that meant. And it was borrowing a term from set theory, okay? Uh, and so not in our normal uh, vocabulary, okay? Uh, for most of us, again, some of the people in my class are uh, mathematicians and they love set theory, okay? In which case, um, it comes from this thing called a set comprehension, okay? The best way is for us to think of a list comprehension uh, as a list maker, okay? It just makes lists. And typically, it makes lists from old lists, okay? That's probably the easiest way to think of it. Okay, so here's the syntax. It's going to yield a new list, okay? And then in the square brackets, the square brackets are saying, this is going to give me a list, right? We have expression for item and iterable if condition equal equal true. Now, there's a lot of possible parts in here. I think we're showing all of the parts right here. Okay, so... A pretty good discussion of this, I have a link to here, and let me bring this up. This is the discussion from uh, W3 Schools, okay? And um, uh, what do we have here? Okay, so... Um, uh, here's what we're trying to do. What well, we're, we're actually showing two ways to do this. Uh, okay. Uh, the beginning list has a bunch of uh, fruit names. Okay. And he wants to create a new list. And he wants to include all, all the fruit names that include the letter A. So apple, yes, banana, yes, cherry, no, kiwi, no, mango, yes. So if you're to do this with a simple for in loop, you would say for x in fruits, if a and x, new list append x. Okay. If you wanted to do this with a list comprehension, again, think list banker, uh, you would just say new list gets assigned the value and then in the square brackets uh, for uh, oh we want the value x for x in fruits if a in x okay now this makes some people's head hurts right uh, one of the things that makes it hurts the worse is this use of x okay and and here's where you come up against the real uh, tension like i've been i've been kind of preaching all semester long against uh short uh variable names with the you know kind of algebraic names like x and y and a b c and that kind of stuff and why well because you don't get context from them okay uh now these features, like uh, lists are comprehensive, are shorthands, okay? And so the longer your names, the longer the code, the less of a shorthand you have. So I can understand why the authors want to use short names, because uh, this the whole genre is about shortness, okay? On the other hand, this is very confusing. So I'm going to show you my examples, which I think are less confusing. OK. So um, let's see. I had a couple other things I want to talk about on the slide before I get there. Uh, using a list a comprehensive, and is this an alternative to creating an empty list and then populating it with a for in loop? That's all, okay? You can think of the comprehension uh, as a shorthand syntax for that longer approach. And this is the number 50, creating lists with and without list uh, comprehensions. So I do a pretty similar thing to what I just showed you, but I think I'm using better variable names, okay? 
In fact, I know I am. Okay, so here's what I've got. I've got uh, a list of cities that include three in Illinois, one in New York, and one in New Jersey. Okay, so that's, that's my original list. And what I want to do is I want to create a sub list that only includes the cities in Illinois. And I want to do it using the same kind of scheme that we use for the fruits that included the letter A. So here's what I've done. Uh, I print the original list and I just print cities. And let's put the rest of this into a comment. Okay. So I give this a run. And here's the original list. Chicago, Illinois, New York, New York, Champaign, Illinois, Moline, Illinois, Trenton, New Jersey. Okay. Now, I can create the sublist of Illinois cities uh, the way... Uh, uh, with, uh, well, let me do this in the opposite order, okay? Let me show it with the for in first, okay? So, how do I do it with the for in? Well, I set Illinois cities equal to the empty list, and then I say for city in cities, if ill in cities, well, append city. And then when I'm done, I print Illinois cities. So when I run this, you'll see that I got Chicago, Champaign, and Moline, but I didn't get New York, New York, or Trenton, New Jersey, because they didn't include that capital IL. Okay, and this is uh, something I think we know how to do. Okay, now, how would we do this as a list comprehension? Well, uh, uh, you don't have to create the empty list. The comprehension does it for you. It always throws off a new list. Okay, so you can just, whatever variable you're going to save it in, Illinois cities, is going to get a new list. And the expression is city. For city in cities, if uh, IL in city. So where did it get uh, cities? Well, I got that up here. That's just a variable name from up here. Um, where did it get city? Well, this is just the index variable name that we'd use in any um, uh, for loop right? Uh, what do we mean by city? We mean, um, we just want to use the value as we found it, okay? And I'll, I'll show you how we could do something slightly different if we wanted to, okay? Uh, and this if IL in city, this is just the conditional part of the list comprehension syntax, okay? Now, do we need the conditional part? No, you can um, you can do this, but without some kind of conditional part or some kind of transformation, well, you're just going to get a copy of the list. If we just said uh, city for city in cities, well, then they would be the same as the cities list. Okay, so if we run this, we shall see that the list comprehension version and the for in version do the same thing. Okay. Now, sometimes I find it a little bit hard to know why we need an expression here. And this is because we can further change this. We could say uh, city.upper. No, I'm sorry, city upper. We could do that. So we could say, find the city from this and then shift it to upper. So if we do this, you'll see we've capitalized the name of the city. Okay. Uh, so 
it's pretty powerful. But uh, of course, could we have done that here? Could we have said append city dot upper? Yeah, we could have. Right? We could have done that there too. All right. All right. So there's really, uh, I had somebody, I went back and forth on Twitter with uh, somebody about whether you could do anything in a list uh, comprehension that you couldn't do in the equivalent for in loop. And he was adamantly arguing that arguing that it could, but I, I don't think he did a good job of explaining what that was. And if there is a, something, it's a very small use uh, case. Um, uh, this is just a shorthand syntax. This comprehension is the shorthand syntax for the for in version. So I'm going to back this off and take the shift to uppers out of it. Okay, and run it one more time. And then we get the same thing. Okay, so do you need to use these extra language features like uh, lambdas and list uh, comprehensions? No, you don't. You know, whether you decide to adopt them or not is up to you. But in a world where you're going to find your way to examples that include them, okay, I wanted you to know what they are. And um, when you go on to data science courses, you're going to find that people are at least using lambdas and perhaps using list uh, comprehensions. And um, I, I've given you the reference here to come back and find that stuff. And that is it. So I'm just going to say bye until next time. Bye bye.